So, John, it's been a while since we've talked. In person, we talked in Yes, we <laughs> it's true, in person. But uh, we um, created an online course together, which now exists on Cap Me Into Win. And we're just now rolling the whole website out and promoting your video uh, course called uh, Global Movement Against Extremist Nationalism is what we decided to call your course. <laughs> and um, it also exists on YouTube. But I think that it's, um, I really wanted to talk to you about what you see right now, because we, it really does seem apocalyptic. <laughs> and, and I do feel scared. I do feel like things are completely insane or falling apart. Um, and so I just, I was just wondering if maybe you could kind of, give sort of an overview of the world according to John Pfeffer <laughs> and sort of point out the things that you find scary. Well, I, I, I'll start with a, a general observation and then, um, and then I'll give a quick update on kind of where we are in terms of global extremism. And then maybe I'll wrap that up uh, quickly with, uh, with another general observation. Uh, but the general observation is one of the scariest things I find is uh, the question of trust. Um, because I'm writing a piece right now on, on this relationship between trust and you know, geopolitics. And you know, at the moment, because of COVID-19, we basically don't trust anybody any longer. I mean, uh, at a very basic level, you see someone walking down the street towards you and you cross to the other side. Um, you are even friends, uh, people that you obviously trusted before, you have a question mark. Uh, are they potentially a, a vector of, uh, of disease? Um, and they may not even know, uh, or they may even give you a, uh, you know, show you their certificate that they tested negative, but who knows what happened between the time that they tested negative uh, or they took the test and, and when they show you the certificate. So there are all these question marks. And, and uh, on a you know, on an interpersonal level, that's frustrating and, and, and you know, and depressing. But on a national and international level, it could have actually tremendously negative impact because trust is so important in terms of, uh, of holding a country together and in some sense holding geopolitics together, all the way from uh, the global assembly line. In other words, the uh, all of the connections that are necessary, say, to bring a, an, an iPhone together from its component parts uh, to a store and into your pocket, all of that requires, to a certain extent, trust. I mean, trust in, at a factory level, uh, trust in, in the store level, uh, trust in the financing. If trust begins to erode, then the, the very glue that holds together the global economy starts to, uh, to dissipate. Um, but it also, in terms of uh, uh, an election, for instance, you know, we, we have to trust that the results are, are, uh, are accurate. We have to trust that you know, our polling place is safe. We have to trust that the president is going to actually abide by the, you know, by the, uh, the, the decisions of the electorate. If trust is not there, then the whole democratic project actually uh, has, is on shifting sand. Now, it's not like COVID-19 is the only reason that uh, there's mistrust out there. Obviously, you know, three years of Donald Trump calling into question reality, you know, uh, the, the, the coronavirus, uh, science of climate change, his nonstop lies. Of course, all of that erodes trust as well. And there are other reasons for the erosion of trust, but, but you could say that COVID-19 is, is, uh, represents a potential tipping point, um, not only in this country, but the global. Okay, so that's a general, um, a general reflection on something that is truly scary and insane about the, the COVID-19 moment. Uh, briefly, in terms of uh, an update on where extremism is, uh, the far right, I say there are basically um, kind of three different categories you have to look at. One are the, the, the far right, um, the extremists who are in power, people like Donald Trump in the United States, uh, 
Bolsonaro in Brazil, uh, Orban in Hungary. And then you have, a, you have the, the far right parties that are not in power, uh, that are hoped to be in power, but National Assembly in France, for instance, or the Swedish Democrats, a number of far right parties. And then you have, well, the truly scary and insane folks, and that would be the so-called accelerationists. And the accelerationists are the folks who would like to accelerate the, um, the collapse of society. Um, mm. These are people like the Boogaloo Boys that people might have heard of. It also includes, um, you know, neo-Nazis, white supremacists, people who want to basically instigate a race riot in this country um, and have wanted to do so for several years. But the COVID-19 uh, for them represents an enormous opportunity because, um, you know, they, there's a possibility that society might just become unhinged, you know in part because of a lack of trust, but for a number of other reasons. Wait, let me stop you there for a second. I mean, but what is the end goal for them, the accelerators? I mean, and is that the same end goal or do they have different end goals? They have different end goals. I mean, uh, mm-hmm. for instance, you know, white supremacists would like, you know, for instance, to create a white homeland, um, for instance, in the Pacific Northwest uh, or up in, you know, the Vermont Maine area. Uh, this has been a long held goal of theirs. Um, others are kind of the survivalist um, variety and they uh, don't really want any kind of social interaction. They just want to kind of hoard their stuff and have their guns and have a compound of their family and maybe some friends. Um, and then maybe there would be a, a third category, which uh, is is not exactly certain what would happen when uh, when the liberal establishment falls apart, but they have this idea somehow that um, that figures like uh, a, a Trump or a, or a Tom Cotton, the senator from Arkansas, um, would come to the fore, and we would have kind of a a military dictatorship um, that again would you know represent the interests of white people, gun owners, and so forth. So I think those are kind of three somewhat separate uh, end goals for the accelerations. Mm, okay. So those are, uh, those are the accelerators and then the other categories? And, uh, so the, the first category would be those, uh, the far right folks who are in power already, like Trump or Bolsonaro or Orban. And, and during the COVID-19 crisis, they've, they've kind of divided into two overlapping categories. There's the denialists, and then the power grabbers. The denialists, of course, were arguing early on that the COVID-19 was not a threat. Um, it was like a cold, it was a flu, but not really a serious pandemic. Um, and that anybody who was making that case, scientists, you know, policy people, were doing so only for political reasons, uh, to take down uh, the, the economy, for instance, to undermine the authority of Donald Trump, um, to stop logging in the Amazon, whatever. I mean, there are a variety of different um, reasons why they were denying uh, the, the existence or the, or the lethality of, of COVID-19. Um, but I think that has gradually shifted into the other category, which is the power grabbers, who very uh, early on, people like Viktor Orban or Benjamin Netanyahu uh, did not deny um, the existence of COVID-19, but rather saw it as an opportunity to advance their agenda. Um, Orban, for instance, in Hungary has long said that uh, immigrants are the greatest threat to kind of white Christian Hungary. And now he has this additional argument he can make that immigrants are dangerous not only because of who they are, but what they carry, namely potentially uh, a virus. Um, so his, his approach of closing down borders um, and mm-hmm. erecting walls becomes in fact, not only the policy for Hungary, or an extension of what had previously been the policy for Hungary, but it becomes the de facto policy for, well, about 100 mm-hmm. countries around the world. Um, but uh, but for, for Orban, it's specifically uh, an opportunity for him to push through a, a kind of what he called an enabling act, a uh, state of emergency, basically, in Hungary, that allowed him to concentrate power in his hands. Um, mm-hmm. So you see a number of power grabs like that by um, what would have been dubbed coronavirus authoritarians around the world. <laughs> coronavirus authoritarians. Well, you know what? Um, I want to 
ask you to elaborate on. Um, the question I have is, you know, there are people who have very clear beliefs about the world. They believe that white people are superior, for example. And then there are people who just, they see a way to just gain personal power, mm. not even group power, but just personal power, mm. right? Just sheer kind of entrepreneurial, opportunistic people. Mm. And they just see a pathway to getting there. So it could be that for some people, they're not exactly white supremacists, but they just see the rhetoric and the white resentment as just a pathway, like a train or plane they can ride to, to gain personal power. And so, and I, I've always had these questions about people like Donald Trump and others, like what do they actually believe other than their desire for, for power, yeah. right? Um, and, and so I don't, I know that's like difficult to get into like the psyches and the minds of the people, but I, I'm just wondering like, as you analyze the political landscape as you're doing, like, if you think about the distinction between like real ideology versus opportunistic, you know, just entrepreneurial, um, greedy people, like, mm -hmm. I don't know. I'm assuming Trump is like more in the second kind. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, an invitation to enter the mind of Donald Trump or Bolsonaro is truly an invitation. <laughs> Is it a, a yeah. scary and insane place? <laughs> but, uh -huh. uh, but I think your distinction is an important one between an ideologue and an opportunist. And, and there are, of course, some people who are both ideologues and opportunists. Very uh, true. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, Viktor Orban, I would say, is both an ideologue and an opportunist in the sense that, you know, Orban in Hungary had started out as a liberal. Um, back in the late 1980s, and not just a, a casual liberal, but the leader of the liberals in the country. Um, but he realized that liberalism in Hungary was a largely discredited philosophy, a political ideology. And if he was going to get anywhere politically, he'd have to abandon that particular philosophy. So, uh, so he became he became quite clearly an opportunist. Now, you could say he was an opportunist from the beginning that his liberal uh, ideology at the beginning was simply, you know, what he perceived to be the way to power at that time. And as soon as it no longer represented a ladder to success, he threw that ladder away and found a different ladder. Um, but since he has become a conservative, it would seem as though that uh, he now holds those beliefs, uh, you know, about you know, marriage only between being between a man and a woman, that uh, Hungary represents the pinnacle of Christian civilization, that uh, immigrants are dangerous, that globalists like George Soros are dangerous, et cetera, et cetera, that that effectively has become his ideology. Um, and it's hard to imagine him finding a different ladder at this point. In other words, if an opportunist occupies an ideology long enough, uh, he, he inhabits it thoroughly. Mm -hmm. There are others, I think, who are a little bit um, uh, more difficult to pin down. I mean, someone like Duterte in, in the Philippines, for instance. I mean, Duterte started out kind of being a, associated with the left, but the, even with the Communist Party in, in the Philippines. Um, since he's come to power, it's been very difficult to figure out what his ideology is, other right. than his stay in power and to kill a lot of people, like 27,000 extrajudicial murders uh, in three years. Um, and so there, I think it's, it's clearer that uh, Duterte is an, is an opportunist rather than an ideologue. Um, and I think you can find, you know, say, purer ideologues like, um, I don't know, uh, uh, you know, I, I would say hmm, in the pure ideologue, maybe Shinzo Abe would be, would be a, he's been quite consistent throughout his entire career as a Japanese politician in, uh, in embodying Japanese far right ideals. Um, there are, op there are obviously some opportunist streaks to him, but, but basically mm -hmm. he's an ideologue. Um, and I would say probably Netanyahu as well in Israel. I mean, he's been pretty consistent in his, in his views all along. 
But uh, but if you look at someone like Erdogan in Turkey, he's been all over the place uh, in his right. philosophy over the last 15, 20 years. I mean, what they all have in common, though, is that they're fundamentally anti-democratic. Mm-hmm. So against people. Well, they're they're anti-liberal. Um, I mean, they okay. would say that they're they're actually pro-democratic. I mean, Orban would say he's pro-democratic, but um, but democracy for them means um, uh, a particular kind of populism in which they identify the people. Uh, as with a capital P, <laughs> as the people behind them and everybody else who's opposed to them are really not not really people, um, not part of the people, um, and that uh, they embrace democratic procedures. I mean, Erdogan, Orban, uh, Duterte, all of you know, uh, uh, come to power democratically. They all uh, uh, exist in a multi-party system. What they don't agree with is liberalism, and, and uh, Orban has been really clear about that. Orban says, I am an illiberal politician. In other words, he doesn't believe in um, in some of the checks and balances that, uh, for instance, you would find in constitutional democracies. Um, he's uncomfortable with, uh, when he says li- uh, illiberal in this sense, he also means in, in, in an economic sense. He's, he's very much opposed to, um, to, as the Europeans call it, liberal uh, economics, which we would call either neoliberalism or um, laissez-faire economics. Um, and, and therefore that, un, that informs their critique of globalization because globalization becomes a vehicle for liberal economics and that's why they're against it. So th- they make a very clear distinction in, in their mind at least between liberalism and democracy. Mm-hmm. And can you just kind of break down what you mean by liberalism there? Mm-hmm. Uh, what I mean or what they mean? Yeah, what, what you mean, what you mean. So, uh, so liberalism, uh, let's say in the American context, because of course liberalism means different things here in the United States and, and in Europe and in other countries. But here in this country, liberalism, generally speaking at this point, is, uh, is, is basically three concepts. One is uh, liberal uh, politics, um, And that's a kind of conception of democracy, both procedurally, um, but also in terms of the structure of government, um, checks and balances, uh, the the role of uh, the courts in in, in representing a a check on power. So the importance of of, uh, preventing absolutism from returning to this country as as it was when we were a colony of Britain. Um, Then there's liberal economics uh, and liberal economics uh, in, in the American context, it, it really is um, uh, a, a marriage of um, the market and democracy, um, uh, that the two go hand in hand in, in, in an important way in serving as the backbone of society. But then there's this third element that has developed over time, and that is our peculiarly American understanding of liberalism, which means uh, government intervention in the economy uh, mm-hmm. to uh, to establish a social safety net, to uh, help um, lift up the, the weakest uh, members of society, um, to ensure that uh, that the boom and bust cycles of the economy are, are not as extreme. So liberalism in the American context means this kind of Keynesian, uh, after John Maynard Keynes, um, yeah. interventions into the economy. But liberalism in Europe means something in the economic sense quite the opposite. Um, that, that kind of liberalism is, uh, is all about removing the state from the economy and in contrast to what is either called social uh, democracy or socialism. Um, so the mm-hmm. liberalism is, is distinct in the European context in that sense. Mm-hmm. So let's um, stay with American liberalism for um, a second. And I, d- I don't want to derail you from all the scary and insane things you wanted to talk about. <laughs> But <laughs> I'm going to indulge in things that scare me for a second. So, um, so tell, explain to me how liberalism can be sustained when we have so much corruption in our government. Hmm. So it seems to me that corruption or corrupt states, corrupt governments help 
the conservative argument that we should be very anti-government, want government out of our lives, right? And it hurts the liberal cause, yeah. right? And so when we go, all of us, liberals and conservatives, independents, go around saying our government is corrupt, there's too much money in politics. To me, like that helps conservatives and hurts liberals. Am I right about this? Well, I, I think it's a, that's, a, that's a valid point. And, uh, and unfortunately, I think, well, conservatives use that um, to their own uh, political gain. In other words, you know, Trump comes into office saying he's going to drain the swamp. In other words, he's, he's absolutely against the corruption in Washington uh, and corruption in general, you could say. But anyway, specifically the corruption in Washington. Then he gets to Washington and, uh, and it's nothing but corruption coming from him. I mean, just... <laughs> The secretary of, of uh, labor, you know, secretary of, of everybody, everybody <sighs> he brings in is corrupt. All of his actions are corrupt in terms of, you know, the emoluments clause of the constitution, his, his use of his, his office, in other words, to, um, to, uh, to make money for himself, his organization, his family, his cronies. It's, it's just nothing but corruption. And then the conservatives can turn around and say, well, you see, we, we, we were right. It is corrupt and we can take government out of the economy. Um, and, you know, it's like going in and, you know, uh, there's a nice picnic going on in front of you and you go and you urinate on it. And then you say, "Pa, told you the food was lousy. And you're like, wait, but it was fine before you just did that terrible thing. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, corruption is, uh, is, is often used by conservatives for their own um, narrow purposes. Uh, liberalism, in, in, at least in theory, is supposed to be um, set against corruption. In other words, you set up these checks and balances in government to prevent the concentration mm -hmm. of power, which encourages corruption. You, you establish a watchdog uh, institutions within government to ensure that, that no one can get away with anything. And then because you can't, you really even trust the government itself can police itself, you establish watchdog institutions or you strengthen watch, watchdog institutions outside of government, the media, um, legal system, uh, uh, any any number of monitors that are in place that are constantly checking to see if, if corruption is, is happening. Um, so uh, so that that ideally is is what liberalism does. So even if the government is is intervening in the economy, there are checks and balances both within government and outside of government to ensure that that uh, that nexus, if you will, uh, between government and the economy is not corrupt. Now, again, that's theory. If you want to look at practice, well, of course, for the last uh, 100 years or more, we've had a military industrial complex, which is, what is it? It's the government intervening in the economy. Uh, it's the only so-called socialist uh, program that the American government really has had, has been consistently supporting for, for decades. Mm -hmm. um, and the... Number one, it uh, <laughs> it works. I mean, if you if uh, at at, uh, at one level, I mean, it employs a lot of people. Uh, it produces a lot of weapons. Uh, it's very successful in its exports. Uh, it has a very uh, strong research and development arm in DARPA. I mean, the military industrial complex at one level is you know proof that government can intervene in the economy very successfully. It just happens to be producing lousy things, but okay, uh, that's the uh, aside, <laughs> beside the point. Uh, but on the other side, you can say, well, but it's extraordinarily corrupt. And, you know, we have plenty of stories of, you know, the thousand dollar toilet seats or the $10,000 hammers or, you mm -hmm. know, the, the corruption that's, that is so embedded in this process. Um, and because it's government and business together, it's very difficult for outside watchdog institutions I mean, they can they can monitor this, but they can't fundamentally have any effect on it because uh, the military industrial complex is it has widespread political support. And I don't mean I don't mean like 75 percent. I don't mean 80 percent of Congress supports it. I mean, 99 percent because uh, the military industrial complex 
has you know manufacturing that takes place in every district, every congressional mm. district. Now that is built into the system. I would argue that that is a corrupt element of the system as well, because it ensures political support even from people who are on the record saying that they are opposed to the military industrial complex. Uh, mm -hmm. Bernie Sanders, uh, you know, I, who I love, but you know, he had you know military contractors up in in Vermont that he went to bat for because he has to it means jobs it means growth for the state if you go up against it you're you're gonna lose in mm. your next election what what would what would you have done if you were bernie sanders uh <laughs> i've never <laughs> gone into politics in the first place <laughs> you know, god what are you doing a, a new york jew in vermont I mean, come on uh, no. <laughs> i mean as a politician you are sworn to uphold the constitution and be pragmatic you know i mean that's who violates those things you know if you violate the first you're you know you're kicked out and if you violate the second, you're voted out. Um, and so I don't think any politician, any one politician can change that. I think it has to be, first of all, mm -hmm. you have to defund the military industrial complex. You have to take the money yeah. out. If you don't take the money out, there's no way that you can ever have any political leverage. Over it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, okay, so we can go back to what scares you. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Tell me more. <laughs> <laughs> what scares me today? Um, yeah. Well, I mean, here, here's here's another kind of scary thought. I mean, there are basically three um, positions uh, that are fighting for supremacy in this COVID era. One is um, the far right, the, uh, which I've talked a little bit about, and represented by by Trump or Bolsonaro. Or, Netanyahu, uh, or Putin, or frankly, Xi Jinping, as far as I'm concerned. Um, although Xi Jinping's more of an authoritarian and very pragmatic, um, not so much a, a, a right-wing ideologue. Um, but anyway, there's that kind of right-wing slash authoritarian uh, approach. Then there's uh, the kind of liberal establishment, uh, the status quo ante, you know, the status quo as it, as it existed, maybe not before COVID in some countries, but Maybe 10 years ago, Obama style liberalism, if you will. Um, and, uh, and that's, you know, uh, that has been discredited in a number of ways. Um, uh, I think uh, the, the economic project of globalization, unfortunately, has been discredited, you know, free trade agreements that are. Um, uh, unregulated uh, and, de and the project of deregulation. Uh, the discrediting of, of the liberal establishment can't necessarily be measured simply by bad policies or bad outcomes. It can be measured, I think, most obviously by all the votes that go to people like Donald Trump. Um, that represents kind of a, a real disenchantment uh, among the populace to the liberal establishment. Um, or the establishment in general. I mean, if you look at Brazil, it wasn't exactly a liberal establishment. It was, uh, you know, under Lula, it was a radical establishment. And, uh, there was considerable disenchantment with that as well, in part because of corruption and, and rather widespread corruption. Um, so those are those are two kind of battling, and, and that's of course going to be what we see in the elections here in, in November between Biden, who's very much a representative of Obama-style liberalism, and Donald Trump. And then you have a third, considerably weaker um, position, which would be, you know, say the progressive slash transformative position that says, look, you know, we're not happy with the liberal establishment. Um, we believe that, that government can play an important role in the economy. In fact, it has to. We believe in internationalism and in joining hands across borders to solve global problems. Um, we believe in uh, addressing systematic inequalities in society, racial, gender, um, economic inequalities. Um, and for the most part, we're not in power <laughs> anywhere. I mean, yeah, we have, you could find some version of that in New Zealand, in Iceland, um, maybe a little bit in Spain, maybe a little bit in South Korea, some version of, of, of progressivism that it's, it's not simply kind of uh, 
pinkish liberalism. Um, but generally speaking, it's not in power. And here in the United States, it's well, never really been in power. Um, although Bernie Sanders did represent that to a certain extent in, in the primaries. And, and there are people in Congress like AOC um, and others who, who represent kind of pro progressive uh, positions. And I think actually have been successful in uh, pulling the Democratic Party leftward. And there obviously was a, a set of um, committees established by the Biden campaign and the Sanders campaign uh, mm -hmm. to identify common positions um, on everything except, uh, strangely, foreign policy. Uh, but those common positions, I do think, represent a, a significant pull to the left by the, um, by the Biden party and uh, or by the Democratic Party, by the Biden campaign. And I think uh, they've done so because they recognize uh, this deep well of disenchantment that Trump tapped into and could potentially tap into again in November. Mm -hmm. So, okay, so let me just pause for a second there. Um, I think uh, going back to the initial topic of trust, I think the situation now is that um, there are a lot of progressives who are progressive in the sense that they still want um, something that's more uh, socialist or Marxist, but they don't trust our institutions, our current institutions. Mm. They just lack trust. So it's, it's not, you know, they, they trust that maybe slightly more than um, corporatists or capitalists, but not really. I think there are just so many people who are feeling like there's no institution, no one that we could trust, mm. right? Yeah. And so then we kind of feel this sense of um, abandonment. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and, and so we don't really feel affiliated with any party. There's no group identification that feels right, no yeah. label that feels right. Yeah. I, I just think we're kind of in the wilderness, <laughs> yes. right? And yes. and I, I find that scary, just yeah. being in this wilderness where we don't have even the right words to describe how we're feeling, what we're thinking, what we believe. It's just that we're just disenchanted, disgusted even with all of it. Yeah, and I, I, I completely agree with that. And, you know, prior to the pandemic, I think one of the, one of the real um, ways of addressing that that people have had is to kind of go hyper-local, you know, to say, look, I, I, I can't control what goes on, even at the state level, certainly not at the federal government, and forget about the international level. But here in my town or my community or even in my neighborhood, um, you know, I can have... Uh, much more trust uh, because, you know, I, I, I know these people, you know, and, and I, I, I have a higher level of trust that there isn't corruption going on. Um, I can see where things are effective, you know, we, you know, we, we campaign to have, you know, a, another um, a crosswalk uh, up the street and lo and behold, it's done. And so, that builds trust. It's, you know, you, you have to, you know, the union movement, I think, was very clear about this. You have to have very concrete deliverables uh, that, that, you know, build mm -hmm. faith in the institution. If the union does not right. provide stuff for folks, people are going to leave the union, you know. So uh, I think that that, mm -hmm. you know, fostered a kind of a, a localism and, and sometimes yeah. even a trans localism. But but the pandemic, and this is the scary part, is, you know, there's no opportunity for face-to-face -face at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, and particularly among strangers, you know, mm -hmm. politics is all about strangers, meeting strangers. I mean, uh, <laughs> you know, if you're just running for office on your block, you know, to be block captain, well, maybe you know everybody, but anything above that, you're going to have to start talking to people mm -hmm. Don't know, and mm -hmm. and not to be able to have uh, any contact with strangers or to have what what 
uh, you would call spontaneous meetings. Um, like you and I are talking right now. It's not spontaneous. I mean, we plan this. Every Zoom call is a planned call. You don't have spontaneous Zoom calls. Although there, are, I've read of some situations where you just log on and maybe you'll meet somebody new, but that's usually for dating purposes, not for political purposes. So the, the whole notion of spontaneity and of meeting mm -hmm. strangers has been kind of stripped from our political sphere. Um, and so any of the tools to kind of combat exactly what you're talking about, the, the feeling of alienation from, mm -hmm. um, from community, from society, from, from government, uh, those tools are no longer available to us. All we can hope for is um, that either the pandemic recedes um, and becomes like pandemics in the past, uh, or we develop completely new tools for, mm -hmm. uh, for having a democracy. And um, I'm not sure what mm -hmm. those tools look like because I haven't seen yeah. them. Um, but, uh, but again, the, the insight that, I, uh, that the unions have made about deliverables has to be scaled up. I mean, mm -hmm. you can't have any trust in federal government unless it's providing deliverables, that your tax right. dollars actually translate into something concrete that you see. Mm -hmm. Your tax dollars yeah. are going out there and all you see are, is Trump getting rich <laughs> and Bezos getting rich. Then you're like, why am I paying taxes? You know, it's not translating into anything right. in my life. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's hard to believe in our government right now. <laughs> Let me put it that way. I mean, when I mean, of course, in theory, I want another massive bailout, but not if if it's going to go to billionaires and sure. Trump's friends like well, <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't want that. That just feels like another swindle. Um, I mean, I think something, I mean, experiencing something new and interesting. I just moved to Pittsburgh, as you know, I just told you. And um, it, I don't know if it's Fred Rogers' influence, but in my neighborhood, uh, right, it's in, called Mount Lebanon. People are like extremely friendly. The neighbors are extremely friendly. <laughs> I've never had neighbors like these. <laughs> And, <laughs> and, and, <see> Annabelle. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's making me feel just differently about what it means to be in, be a neighbor. Oh. And because it's very powerful, you feel compelled to say hello to everybody you pass on the street. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And and also like the front yard is like becomes like a civic space because People are at least seeing one another from a distance, right? So I think people are just like finding ways to spend more time in the front yard. At least you can wave to people yeah. as opposed to being in the backyard. And so, so there are these interesting kind of things that are organically happening, I think, because we have this need, this mm -hmm. like innate need to socialize and to feel connected, right? And so I guess that's kind of what I'm hanging on to is when I see expressions of that deep human desire to be just connected to other people so that they're not strangers. Yeah. I love the way you kept saying strangers, but I mean, <laughs> you know, but, but like in an instant, they go from a stranger to a neighbor or somebody that you have some kind of connection with, right? Like I was outside and, and there was a guy who was just like looking very confused and lost. And he looked at me and said, um, I'm looking for a comet. Like he was looking up at the sky. I guess there was supposed to be a comet. I don't, I didn't, I missed the comet. But in any case, I mean, just like interactions like that, you know, that just humanize one another. And I guess that's, that's what I keep coming back to. Like I can still find that. It's not just in Pittsburgh. It's like in other places too, where you just see people just reaching into themselves to like connect. And that's going to be there. I don't think that's going to go away. That's going to stay with us. I hope, I hope you're right. I mean, it, it, reminds, <laughs> me, it reminds me of, you know, the, the cultures that believe that had entirely different, entirely different kind of conception of what a stranger is because they believe that a stranger could be either an angel in disguise <laughs> who was down on earth or a god 
uh, are a goddess in disguise. You know, and the, the Greeks have this conception that you know, the gods were, and goddesses would occasionally take human form and come down. And maybe they'd show up at your door and want dinner. So you really have to be nice to them because if you were not nice to them, they could be pretty vengeful and turn you into a rock or something. So their <laughs> attitude towards strangers was, was quite, uh, I think, quite good, you know. Um, and uh, as well as, you know, like Bedouin societies where, you know, you had to rely mm -hmm. on, on the, uh, the, the kindness of strangers or else you die, you know. So, so I think there are these traditions we can, we can draw on. But my fear is, um, and, you know, and, and this is something pre-pandemic, but what, what my fear is in terms of the pandemic is that we'll, be, we'll turn into like, um, like, uh, 13th century Florence. Um, and I, I was reminded of this uh, recently when I, was, when I was kind of doing some research because I I'd visited Dante's house in, in Florence when I was there. And, and I saw a picture of what Florence at the time looked like. And it blew my mind because it was completely different from what I expected Florence to look like in the mm. 13th century. Because I expected, you know, these medieval cities would have the the houses pressed together, you know, and, and, and everyone's kind of living on top of each other. But that actually was not the case in, in, in 13th century Florence, because it, there was part of the city that was like that. And that's where the poor people lived. But for anybody who had any wealth at all, they, they built towers. And so you have these mm. tower houses that were actually quite isolated from one another. And they were garrisoned because 13th century Florence was a dangerous place. I mean, there were warring factions and you never knew when disease would strike. And, you know, there was, there was crime. And so every family, extended family, lived in these big towers, these skyscrapers, essentially, of the time. And then the poor people lived in the ghettos, you know, the kind of pressed together housing. And I'm afraid that, you know, the... the the wealth inequality that was already building prior to the pandemic, but add on to that, you know, the, the erosion of trust um, and fear of strangers that COVID is, is you know, mm -hmm. accelerating leads to this kind of um, gated community on the one hand and the teeming masses. In other words, the folks who can um, uh, separate themselves out from they can essentially quarantine themselves from society, and then the essential workers, the essential people who cannot afford to, to separate themselves uh, and, and actually can't abide even by the rules that the government establishes. I mean, you know, you see the, the rules for social distancing, for hand washing, um, for mask wearing. Um, that, that doesn't make any sense whatsoever in much of the, of the global South. I mean, people live on top of each other. They can't, they have, there's no social distance. They, can, they can't stop selling wares at the market. They can't wear masks. They can't wash their hands because there's no source of, of water often. So, you know, that, there's a really strong divide that COVID is, is accentuating between you know, the quarantinable people and the mm. essential, so-called essential workers. Oh, wow. Interesting. Um, let's see. I just want to stay on this notion of estrangement because as we know, you know, Trump likes to divide people um, and he um, likes to create conflict among people. But another way of thinking about that is he's, he is actively trying to estrange us from one another, right? So that we feel alone and scared and we want to cling to something. Mm -hmm. And for his base, he's the person that they want to cling to or, 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 you know, I guess are clinging towards. And of course, for us, we're trying to, I think, find how we're going to like find the thing that's going to make us feel safe. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. well, we're not we're not ones who like the strongman types, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, but we have to feel safe, and I don't know how we're going to feel safe. I mean, how do you, how do we get there, John? How do we get to safety? Um, yeah. Well, I mean, I think you're right that Trump is interested in dividing the country, but he's not necessarily interested in creating entirely atomized population. In other words, he wants you and me and 
and folks who generally dislike him to feel atomized and powerless. But he is, in some sense, very interested in being at the head of a mass movement, a mass movement of you know, people, of his supporters. Uh, in other words, people who lose themselves and their individuality in, into a larger movement in which they feel safe. So in fact, mm -hmm. they feel safe. They feel safer until, of course, in, uh, despite their denialism of, of COVID-19, they contract the disease and become sick or die, and which has happened in some, some cases. But aside from that, they feel safe, um, safe in numbers, safe behind Trump. Um, so for the rest of us, well, I think the first thing is we really we need to restore government, um, the U.S. government, to, you know, to, to some measure of normalcy. Um, mm -hmm. And by normalcy, I mean just, you know, getting the job done, you know, just like, you know, one of the reasons why we're all, we all feel so insecure right now compared to say South Korea or Europe is because we don't have a, a testing, tracing and, and strict quarantine uh, system in place. All those other countries in Europe and most of East Asia are able to open up again their economies because they have those systems in place. People feel safe going out into society at large. Um, they may still maintain some distance, they still may wear masks, but generally speaking, uh, and there has been some resurgence of, of cases, but nothing like what's happened here in the United States. In other words, those are dealing with say three digit um, surges and we're dealing with a five digit surge. Um, so. Number one, we have to have kind of a normal government that we feel is, uh, at the very least, providing the kind of response to this pandemic that we see in, in Europe and Asia. Uh, after that, um, we want to have some sense that, a, a, as it happened in 2009, after we um, elected Obama, that, mm -hmm. um, that there is some kind of financial stability, um, that we are not going off a cliff. Um, and, uh, and then we're not going off mm -hmm. um, uh, simply because we're paying off banks you know, to, to give us a false sense of security, which in some sense is what happened in 2009. So the, we really have to learn from uh, what happened in 2009 and, and provide a real sense of, of economic security, um, a, a real safety net for people. And obviously the thing on most people's minds at the moment is, is health care. I mean, Am I going to get sick? If I get sick, am I going to you know, be able to, to not go bankrupt by going to the hospital? I mean, a lot of people are mm -hmm. staying away from the hospital because they're worried they can't pay for it. So that has to be bedrock, you know, a bedrock um, a provision of, of health care security. OK, so those are like three things, three absolute building blocks for getting to safety the normal political functioning of government, some degree of economic stability and a social safety net that provides at least the basic minimum uh, for, mm -hmm. for people in this country. And do you think that, I mean, I'm convinced of this, but um, do you feel that the Democratic Party and Biden in particular and whoever the running mate is going to be, I'm hoping it's going to be Warren, <laughs> um, do you think that we could do that? We could get there with the Democratic Party? I mean, honestly, I know maybe it's hard for you to answer, but... Um, no, I mean, I, I think we can get there. I mean, I'm not a big fan of the Democratic Party, I mean, as, a, as an overall institution, but, um, but there are a lot of, you know, smart folks there. Um, you know, I think uh, but the Democratic mm -hmm. Party has to do... Uh, has to do three things um, in okay. order to achieve um, those, before it even gets to establishing those, those basic foundation um, stones that I mentioned. And those three things uh, effectively remove Trumpism from society, not just Trump. Removing Trump from the presidency wow. is one thing, but removing Trumpism from society is, is another thing altogether. So the first thing that they have to do is purge, and, and I use that term you know, in its literal sense, <laughs> to purge all of Trump's appointments from uh, mm -hmm. Washington. They, in other words, have to, they have to drain the swamp, drain the swamp of, of the Trump swamp creatures. Uh, they have to um, uh, not work. 
with the Republican right. Party as it is so constituted. Um, they will only they can only collaborate with the Republican Party if the Republican Party uh, eradicates Trumpism from its ranks. And I don't mean I mean okay yeah if there's some crazy dude you know off in uh, Alaska or Arkansas or even you know Maryland who believes in Trumpism. I don't mean like you know a, a, a McCarthyite purge of the Republican Party. I mean changing the Republican Party back to, you know, a sensible institution, which I disagreed with, but at least it was a sensible institution uh, of the 1970s um, before Reagan took over, shall we say. Um, but even even pulling it back to a Reagan uh, night kind of party would be an improvement over um, what it, how it exists now. So that, that's number two. And number three, they have to put these people on trial. There's, there cannot be mm. like uh, Obama made after the Bush years to only look face forward and, and uh, not look backward. I think uh, we can discuss at length whether that was a mistake or not back then, but I absolutely believe it would be a mistake this time around. It's oh. absolutely important to, sh to demonstrate that, that these were criminal elements I believe they should be prosecuted uh, under RICO, under racketeering, as a racketeering yeah. organization. And it should be Trump and his family and his close associates and anybody else who's, who can be brought in under charges of corruption. Um, because you have to demonstrate that we are turning a page. And you're turning a page right. by demonstrating the previous page was wrong. Um, absolutely wrong. You know what? I am so in agreement with you that I want to stand up and applaud right now. <laughs> But <laughs> but at the same time, um, I worry that people are going to say, well, well, we didn't do that with the Iraq War. We didn't really do that with Vietnam War. We didn't really do that with the Civil War. Um, we have a very bad track record. A terrible track record. And in fact, it's precisely yeah. because of that track record that we have to do this. In other words, um, if you look at Reconstruction, the fact that we did not... Um, at that time, uh, destroy the Democratic Party. I mean, it was the Republican Party, of course, that supported Reconstruction and the Democratic Party that was dead set against it. Um, we did not, the Republican Party at that time, unfortunately, um, did not undermine the Democratic Party and insist that it, it transform itself. It didn't, um, didn't push hard enough for structural changes, not only in the South, but also in the mm -hmm. North in terms of... Mm -hmm politics and inclusion. Um, so reconstruction is perhaps the strongest reason, the failures of reconstruction is the strongest reason why we have to, we have to be much more decisive this time around. We have to really dig deeper. Now, herein lies my, my fear, and that is I'm not sure the Democratic Party has the backbone to do that. Right. Um, but, you know, if we have a very decisive mm. win in November, win back the Senate, uh, sweep into the house with lots more members and uh and have you know a whole new generation of people who are like forget it you know we have to we have to you know uh move forward decisively against these these forces of reaction well then we have a different democratic party yeah oh boy <laughs> i i i want to believe that's going to happen but um i'm skeptical um i mean Again, this is, I, I do trust Elizabeth Warren. <laughs> I feel like if she's in a position of power, she's going to make that happen, you know? Well, yeah, but I don't, I don't, I don't, there's no one else I really trust right now. If so. she's not vice president, then I kind of doubt she'll be chosen as vice president. And, you know, ah! she, she will still be uh, in a position to have even perhaps more power, you know? You know, she could actually have more yeah. power as like a, a secretary. Majority leader. Or yeah. majority leader if she stays in yeah. uh, the Senate. So there, I think there are positions for her that that where she could have more effect than. Effect. So I want to step back, way back, step way back from this discussion, right? Like, it, it, imagine you're writing the history of this period twenty years from now. Yeah. For <laughs> cute. Um, <laughs> for your, one of your great books or plays. So you're writing the history of this period right now. Yeah. Right. Okay. So from like historical point of view, 
what's really gone wrong? Like, how in the world did we get here? <laughs> you know, I mean, is, is the enlightenment dead? Was it just completely wrong? I mean, are, is it TV? Like, what, what went wrong? Yeah. Do you have yeah. any thoughts? Well, you know, I just finished this piece looking at um, uh, like what I call the future iconoclasts. In other words, the people who will be tearing down today's statues tomorrow. I mean, we have plenty of people who are tearing down yesterday's <laughs> statues today, and that's an, you know a, a strong movement. Um, but uh, what are what are people going to be tearing down twenty years from now? Um, and you know the, the the premise of this piece was to look at blind spots. You know, for Jefferson, you know, he didn't he didn't think owning slavery was necessarily a terrible thing. I mean, he was conflicted to a certain extent, but there were plenty of, there were plenty of people in society who were saying that slavery is fine. There's certainly plenty of people in the state of Virginia who were saying slave, slavery is necessary. You mm -hmm. might not like it, but it's necessary for our economy, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, and there was a, a Polish revolutionary, uh, Kostushka, who fought in the Revolutionary War. American Revolutionary War, who was Jefferson's friend, who said, you know, Thomas, you have to get rid of your slaves. I mean, it goes against your own principles as you define them. And Jefferson was like, eh, eh, eh. <laughs> you know, he kind of hemmed and hawed, and he never did it. And Kostyushko even left his own legacy, the money he earned as a, as a participant in the Revolutionary War, to go to the education of freed slaves. And he, he named Jefferson as the uh, executor of his will. And Jefferson never did it. He never even did. He never even put Kostyushko's money towards oh, it. Oh God! Think really? about what Jefferson ever did. Um, so <sighs> that was a blind spot. It was a blind spot for many founding fathers. You know. Yeah. Uh, you know. So and you know the what what precipitated my writing of this article was watching Hamilton you know, on Disney. It was yeah. Available and you know Hamilton uh, the play doesn't really address. Uh, slavery very much. There are a couple of asides, but in order to kind of, you know, raise up the, the founding fathers and to kind of continue to venerate them, you have to turn a blind eye to many of their, uh, their, their worst blind spots. So what are our blind spots today? In other words, what are the, what are the counterparts mm. to, to Jefferson's slave owning? And I would say perhaps, you know, the, the, the greatest one is, uh, you know, our, um, our acknowledgement of climate change, we say, you know, we're, almost everybody says scientists, you know, of course, there are some still some denialists, but for the most part, we all acknowledge uh, that we're kind of screwed when it comes to the environment. And yet we fundamentally haven't changed our economic system to reflect that. And we have only changed things around the margins, really, in our own daily life, because um, we still have lots of cars and we still kind of... Um, use air conditioning and eat meat and whatever, you know, I mean, the, the, the aggregate, we haven't changed our lifestyle at all. It's a major blind spot. You can imagine people 20 years from now tearing down statues to everybody and, you know, saying these people talked about yeah. climate change and they didn't do a thing about it. Now, if we take climate change as the major blind spot, I would say, you know, jumping off from that, our refusal to change our um, our individualistic um, economics and politics and society has been the real um, where we went wrong on a fundamental level. You know, um, what you discovered when you went out to, to Pittsburgh, in other words, a community spirit, I think has been in America for a long time alongside our rugged individualism. Um, but uh, Rugged individualism, unfortunately, has been, I think, the stronger component of our economics and our politics. Um, and, uh, and to the extent that we've exported that around the world, and it hasn't taken hold everywhere necessarily, but we've been pretty successful in exporting it. We've managed to remake the world in our image. Uh, and that's what we're coming up against right now in so many different forms. And it's not just the problem of climate change. I mean, it's um, the, the, the gross economic inequality, um, uh, the, the inability to address a pandemic um, because we have not funded uh, 
uh, community health uh, sufficiently. It is expressed in many different ways. So if I had to say where we went wrong 20 years from now, um, I would kind of identify that as, as, a, as a major uh, problem. Mm. Yeah, I mean, but is it individualism or the interpretation of individualism that led to kind of glorifying selfishness? Because I think you can have the romance of individualism without glorifying selfishness. Yeah, I know. I think you're right. And, yeah. you know, yeah. Obviously, Ayn Rand has been very influential in this society and, and her book, The Virtues of Selfishness, says it all. I mean, uh, and, and I wish I could say that that was um, uh, unusual and that she was a fringe figure, figure, and she was a fringe figure. But if you look at the, 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 uh, the, the foundational texts of mm-hmm. our economics, it assumes selfishness. It assumes the rational action of individuals um, who are acting out of selfishness. Um, and, and we've constructed our economy accordingly. Um, mm-hmm. So yes, there, I think, you know, uh, the, the individualism of say, you know, I'm watching free solo of, of someone who goes up, you know, a rock face without ropes, you know, I think it's crazy, but I mean, that's, that's obviously one example of individualism. That's, that's the insane part of this conversation. <laughs> um, but it doesn't, it doesn't like, harm anybody other than that individual. But the, right. the, the sense when, when you take rugged individualism and you inject it into, a, into an economic system and you, you make it the principle around which everything revolves, the harm then goes far beyond any given individual. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, thank you. Actually, that's very helpful. I find that extremely helpful. Um, I, but I guess part that maybe you're evading a little bit is that the basic premise of the American project is based on enlightenment principles, right? That we are capable of rationality, that all of us are capable of rationality, well, that's how- that there is such thing as reason, you know, that for that reason, we should all have rights as individuals. Like, was that just completely wrong? <laughs> Did it, is that a blind spot? Well, no, I don't think it's wrong. I mean, uh, obviously, the problem was it was predicated on a certain understanding of the we. Um, and we've, we, <laughs> the Americans, we Americans uh, have, have uh, over 200 years expanded what that we is. You know, the we started out as just a couple of Puritans who, who believed that they had the God-given right to take land away from Native Americans and kill them in, in the deal uh, and bring over slaves that they didn't consider to be humans. Um, mm-hmm. And so all what they, the, the Enlightenment project of rationality uh, really was uh, circumscribed. It really applied to only a, a handful of people at the beginning. But what makes the American project a redeemable project, if you will, is the interrogation of that pronoun, <laughs> the we, the expansion right. of the we, progressively over the years until, uh, until we even uh, make reparations um, toward mm-hmm. the, the folks that were not part of the we at the beginning of this project. Uh, there was mm-hmm. that, the Supreme Court uh, decision um, around Eastern Oklahoma and Native American uh, treaty rights. Um, there was the, the uh, decision by Asheville, North Carolina, uh, to embrace reparations uh, because of Asheville's role in the slave trade. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, those are, those are kind of extraordinary mm-hmm. examples of not just expanding the we, but, but projecting that back into the past. In other words, to really address the, uh, the original sins, if you, were, uh, if you will, of the American project. Um, mm-hmm. so I don't think the Enlightenment project is wrong. I think it just had to be expanded. Mm-hmm. Yeah, those pronouns. Yes. The pronouns got to us. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, okay. Last thing I want to ask you is, yeah. do you have a call to action for us? What do you think we the people should be doing? Okay, I'm going to ask you about the pronoun. <laughs> which, which <laughs> is Me and you? <laughs> Are we talking about Americans? We talking about everyone I mean, <laughs> we with the capital W. <laughs> so everyone. Yeah. Everyone should be doing. Um, okay, so 
I, I would say the call to action at this point, I mean, we have an urgent you know, problem in front of us and that is dealing with this pandemic. Um, and you know, we, we, have to, uh, we have to deal with, this has to be the, the immediate call call to action. I mean, we have to um, and deal with this internationally. And dealing with this internationally means, of course, you know, first, you know, dealing with the, the worst hotspots, the United States, Brazil, India, Russia, um, getting the pandemic under control in these hotspots, and then ensuring the kind of international network that's, that's uh, necessary to, uh, to uh, guarantee coverage um, globally, access to vaccines, um, uh, the so-called people's vaccine that the UN has, has put out there. And that has to be the first call to action. Um, once we get that under control, okay, we can move on to some other things. You know, we, we can move on to... Um, election? How about the election? Our election here in the United yeah. States? Yeah. Uh, we have to vote. <laughs> we have to definitely vote. But, uh, but not only vote. I mean, we have to hold our representatives accountable. Um, and, uh, you know, right. I, as I said, I have my, my own three point plan in terms of <laughs> purge, uh, you know, non-collaboration with the Republican party and, you know, criminal suit against, uh, Trump and his, his cronies. Um, I, that would be my call to action, you know, immediately the day after the election. I mean, we have to, yeah. well, mm -hmm. I just want to ask you what you think of this. Um, I mean, I think volunteering, I mean, I really believe in volunteering. I, I volunteer every election cycle. Um, I think volunteering right now, finding ways to volunteer, especially for the election, but for any number of things that are urgently needed, could really help restore that sense of connection with people. Mm -hmm. I do. I, I mean, because right now we can start to get more alone, um, more alienated, more disconnected. And I think volunteering would really go a long way in help, helping people to feel like, no, actually we are part of a community. Yeah. We don't have to be estranged. We can work towards things that we believe in and we can learn to trust each other. So I, I think that volunteering would help address that estrangement problem and the trust problem. Um, and yeah, so I don't know. So I'm, I'm trying to, I'm, I would like to get people to like start volunteering. I'm going to help. I'm going to help make sure people do that. You want to volunteer, John? Absolutely. <laughs> <You're> <laughs> first volunteer. <laughs> <laughs> You're, I'm going to sign you up. <laughs> sure. no, oh, I, I agree with you. I think that's, that is a, a profound insight and, and very much connected to the spirit of volunteerism in America. I mean, yes, absolutely. Strange. That is definitely what, I mean, I, I, I keep talking about Tocqueville, but I mean, that is definitely what Tocqueville found in early American democracies, that people volunteered to solve problems together yeah. at the local level. Yeah. And it worked. It was beautiful. And we need to go back to doing that. And you know, people at the moment can't go out bowling, so uh, <laughs> so they have this. Tocqueville didn't talk about bowling. That was somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> that was fun. You, you, you can call your volunteer website bowling together. <laughs> oh, how about voting together? Awesome. <laughs> Okay. Well, thanks so much, John. I, I really, I feel like I could spend hours and hours talking to you. I would love to talk to you again, check in with you again. Maybe we could make this like a monthly thing with like, sure. you know, we gather around your feet. Uh, I wouldn't do that, <laughs> <laughs> but I volunteer to do that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So let's do that. That, that could be your active volunteerism. Um, okay. I will talk to you again soon. Thank you so much. You've been listening to Conversations About a Way Forward from Count Me In to Win and The Talk on Main Street. To learn more, find us on Facebook at The Talk on Main Street.